is that we like to be a little bit more prepared is a great word for it. I prefer self-sufficient, taking care of things myself. And uh, not that I'm a control freak, unless depending on who you ask, <laughs> but I like to do things myself if I can rather than relying on other people. And I've noticed that a lot of the people in our community um, are kind of the same way. They're kind of that same um, self-care, self-sufficient minded people who like to do things for themselves. And one of the missions that we have here with Well Prepared and, and HealthAndMed.com both is to help facilitate that. Um, Mark, you know, that, that you guys just met, kind of sent out a broad email, I guess it was about six, eight months ago, that feels like it's his personal mission to help the community here in Cedar City to become one of the most well-prepared, self-sufficient, self-reliant communities in the state. And I think it's a very lofty goal and something I totally support. So to help do that, um, one of the areas that everybody always feels really uncomfortable with is medicine. What do you do if, you know, there's always, in all the years that I've worked in hospitals and ERs and fire departments and ambulances and clinics, we see people coming in for things that in our minds are not that big a deal. They're, oh, that's a, that's a simple little problem. But because they don't understand what's going on, it's a really big deal for them. So we've had to learn how to educate the community to realize what they can do to help take care of themselves. And the first step is general first aid, kind of changing the way that you think about things. And I promise in this hour, whew, and I forgot my timer, I am bad about going over. Ask any of my students at the university. You'll time for me? Okay. If you'll just raise your hand every 15 minutes, that'd be, that'd be perfect. Um, I get long-winded when I get excited about stuff. So to help mitigate that, I only have about seven slides because like all my classes, I use a model that's called see one, do one, teach one. So I want you guys to see something demonstrated. Then I want you up out of your chairs. Some of you laying on the floor. I've got some blankets for you so you're not laying on, on the floor and then practicing the stuff that we're teaching, and then kind of coaching each other and teaching each other as we go along. Does that sound like a plan for everybody? Yeah. Is that totally unacceptable for anybody? That means that we'll be touching each other appropriately. Is that okay with everybody? All right, good. So to start off with the class today, it's, it's called Basic First Aid in Wilderness Medicine, which is kind of what it is. I if I turn my clicker on. Um, but it's more just kind of a general guide into what we can offer to you guys um, here today, as well as some general basic information education. Um, here's kind of what we've got planned for you today. CABs, which stands for uh, Circulation Breathing or an Airway and Rapid Trauma Assessment. And I'm cool if you sit there, just watch your shoulders if that's okay with you. The cart is kind of sensitive. Is that all right? Perfect. Okay. Alrighty. Um, medical emergencies, and these are going to be things like your heart attacks, your strokes, your diabetes, seizures, things that people kind of encounter quite often. Traumatic injuries, um, bumps and bruises, cuts and scrapes, breaks and fractures. Again, like Mark said, this is an hour class, so we can't go too deep into stuff, but we're going to get you some information that we can. And then some environmental concerns. Uh, one of the things that people overlook the most is how our environment affects us and the dangers in our environment. And then kind of a general basic, very minimalist kit and what needs to go into it. Some of you may have gotten a Ziploc baggie full of stuff. If you don't have one, raise your hand. Okay, I only had 20. I was hoping I only have about 20 people. So we're gonna share kind of back and forth. So make sure you find a partner who has a kit and we'll go from there okay um, this is the wilderness medicine part of this is using unconventional items in healthcare and one of the things that hopefully you get surprised by in your little kit is saran wrap and in my mind I've been teaching it for years it is hands down the miracle healthcare item out there in my opinion and the FDA has finally approved it medical cellophane. It's taken oh, 
thought 15 years. But the research is finally supporting it. So let's start with cabs. And I'm not talking about calling a ride or a taxi here. I'm talking about circulation, airway, and breathing. Who's got a clue what those are? What's circulation? Yeah, what back here, bud? Circulation is basically like ventilation, like your house is at ventilation, and um, basically circulation is allowing air to get through, and so you can breathe. Yep, that's an excellent example of circulating air. However, in this case, what we're talking about is blood, okay? You can circulate fluids as well as, as, as gases like air. So in this case, we are talking about blood. If you don't have a pulse, are you gonna live for very long? Probably not, unless you're one of those uh, vampire people things that are all on TV now, okay? <laughs> Airway, we're talking about the actual structures, your mouth and your throat to your lungs. It's got to be clear. The number one airway obstruction or thing that clogs up your airway, anybody have a guess for it? The number one. The Close. Hot dogs. Oh. Hot, dogs hot, do hot dogs beat out tongues. Tongues are second. But you're right, your tongue is the most common one in our, from our body and hot dogs are the most common four -way, foreign airway body obstruction. <laughs> So tongues and hot dogs, who figures? I mean, who made a piece of meat that's exactly the right shape, just the right size to get stuck in your throat? Oscar Mayer. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about how to make sure that that's clear. And then breathing. It's not just fun. You gotta breathe, right? What happens if you don't breathe? You die. You die. So in this first part of an assessment, whenever you encounter somebody that you don't know what's going on with them and they're unconscious, unresponsive, or having trouble, we want you to check the three things that are probably going to kill them first. A pulse or bleeding, that's circular circulation, airway and breathing. Those two kind of go together. Any questions about that so far? Good. Turn to your partner, your neighbor. If you're in a threesome, it's okay. Just, just kind of, it's a modern day age. Nobody judges anything. So go ahead and turn to somebody nearby you. I want you to look at them and see if you can tell if one, they have a pulse. Two, if they're breathing. Do you guys know how to check a pulse? Let's go over it real quick. Two real common ways to check pulses. Okay, one is right here on your neck. And what I want you to find is that little Eve's apple right here. I call it an Eve's apple, not an Adam's apple, because Eve gave Adam the apple, and we've all been choking ever since. Okay. <laughs> so find your Eve's apple right here in the center of your throat. Now I'll turn your head to one side, and you're going to feel a muscle right here along your neck. You want to go right between your Eve's apple and that muscle and apply gentle pressure until you feel a bump. Does everybody got it? Yeah? Excellent! I also do accents. So if I go into a Scottish accent, don't be surprised. It's just to keep you busy and paying attention. <laughs> which is very different from an Irish accent, which is much better in your nose. All right, next one. Your wrist, uh-huh. You feel right here at the base of your thumb, there's kind of a bony bump right here on your arm. You feel that bony bump? Take your finger and roll it to the inside of your wrist just a little bit and apply pressure. You should feel a bump, bump, bump with your heartbeat there too. These are the two most common places that you find a pulse. Yes, sir? One thing you might want to mention is Try not to use your thumb yep. for uh, checking either one of these places because you want to tell them why? Their pulse. Yep, you've got a great big artery in your thumb. And if you use your thumb to check these places, you're probably going to feel your own heartbeat rather than your person's heartbeat. So try to use a finger, not a thumb. Thank you. Good point. Everybody felt the pulse on somebody or on yourself? Good, you're alive. What about breathing? 
Is everybody in here breathing? How do you know? They've got color to their face. What if it's blue? Blue's a color. What's that? Rise and fall of the chest. That's usually the most accurate one. We want you to watch the rise and fall of their chest or their stomachs. I'm a belly breather. I, I played an instrument and I sing, so I breathe with my belly instead of my, my chest. Anybody else here play a brass, brass instrument? Yeah, brass instruments rock. Okay, so we want to use those CABs are done, right? All right, rapid trauma. I'm going to need a volunteer for this one. Who wants to volunteer to be a person on the floor for me? Um, could I? Sure. You won't be coming back. All right. Okay, now before this, I get the legal stuff out of the way. Do I have permission to touch your body appropriately? Of course. Excellent. Of course. Go ahead and have a lay down here on the on the, uh, the blanket for me. Ask for a pillow. <laughs> now a rapid trauma assessment. We're talking something that's going to take a few seconds, usually about thirty seconds, and all we're looking for is wiggles, wet and whiny. What I mean by wiggles is that whenever you have a broken bone or something that moves that shouldn't move, like two elbows or two knees. That's usually a bad thing, right? Anybody here have two elbows? I'm not gonna say two chins, because I got two of those. Well, look, on the right. same side? Or? On the same side. All right, I was hoping everybody had two elbows. <laughs> All right, so what we're looking for is things that wiggle that shouldn't wiggle. We're looking for wet things like blood. That's wet. If there is anything else that's wet, try to avoid that area because it's probably not blood. And whiny, we're looking for pain, okay? Anything that hurts. And, and so that you don't forget anything or miss anything, we do it in a very organized manner. And we want you to look at the person, listen to what's going on if they moan or groan, and then feel, if you feel anything that doesn't feel right. Trust yourself. Again, you're not a, you're not a rocket surgeon here, so it's okay to just trust your instincts. So we're gonna start up here at his head, and we're just going to squish his head. That's it. Have you ever just wanted to just grab somebody the head and squish them? <laughs> I know I have. Around the throat maybe, but you know, just, just wanna pop them like a pimple. Just kinda of grab their head and see if it feels like a head. Do me a favor, grab your own head. See how your head feels? It feels pretty firm and rigid. It doesn't, your fingers don't slide inside any weird holes or anything like that. It feels normal. It's kind of funny shape, but that's okay. All right, the next you wanna check is the shoulders. Just a real quick push. All right, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. We're going in that order too. Head, shoulders. If you have a broken arm, Ow. it should bend here and here, right? It shouldn't bend here in the middle. So do you need to squeeze each and every part of their arms or is there a faster way to do it? Check the long bones. Yeah, got somebody using technical terminology over here, excellent. You don't have to squeeze and mush everything. Just push where it shouldn't bend and if it does bend, there's a problem. And if it hurts, he'll go, ow. Oh. That tells you something's not right. And you can check both sides. Really quick, next you check the ribs. And notice I'm putting my hands down here. You can flex their ribs down here. Don't put your hands anywhere else, <laughs> okay? Down here. And then we're gonna check legs real quick. And again, should knees move? No? Your knees don't move? Oh, they would bend one way. So they bend this way. Do they bend any other way? We hope not. So if you hold it up and lock that knee, and if you push right here on the outside of his leg and it moves, is that good? No. What about down here? Same thing. Excellent. Guess what? That's all there is to it. And you're checking your hands the whole time for blood. 
Now we have a mantra that we use in class, when I teach classes, that slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Don't rush trying to hurry and do things. Take your time, do it right, and you'll be fast when you get good at it. You guys ready to practice on each other? No? What do you mean, no? Yes. Of course you are. All right, those of you that are willing to practice on each other, I've got some more blankets for you. Find a partner. And if we've got a few people who are willing to be guinea pigs for everybody else. I guess I am. And get groped. I mean, examined. You guys are making this hands-on part really difficult. All right, anybody want to try doing an exam real quick? Can Go. I try my life? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So check head. Check head. Shoulders. Um, what about it? Nothing should be like broken here, right? Or yeah. If you feel what feel, it'll. It's weird. It'll feel like Rice Krispie sound. Mmm. <sighs> yeah. You know, usually they scream in pain. Oh, stop! That's usually a good indication that you should stop. No means no. Check ribs. Oh, arms, I guess. Doesn't matter what order, as long as you go from head to toe. You're going to be my meat puppet. Anybody else want to try on a fresh piece of meat? So. Yes, ma'am. If, like, what's the purpose of doing this if they're conscious? You know if they're mean? conscious, it helps you find what's wrong if they can't tell you for some reason. Okay. Or even if they can, a lot of the times, who's ever, who's ever injured yourselves, broken something, cut something, needed stitches? What did you focus on when it happened? What hurt? What hurt? Oh my gosh, my hand is bleeding! You, really you didn't notice the screwdriver sticking out of your leg. <laughs> okay? We call them distracting injuries. So the purpose of this is to give you a chance to go from head to toe, to find everything. Okay. Does that make sense? Good. I like questions. Questions means you're thinking about the material. How are we sitting on time, Steve? Okay, good. So that's your rapid trauma assessment. It's really simple. It's easy to do, even in the dark. As long as you can find their head and then wiggle your way down their body, you can do a head to toe assessment. Yes, sir? I have a question. The couple of times that I've been in a position where I've had to do that, mm -hmm. the, the patient, the patient, the individual is kind of in shock. Yes. And they're nauseated, and they're white, and they're losing that. But should you be accounting for anything before you start doing your physical assessment? It depends. Oh, gosh, my students hate it when I say that. I have this big banner in my classroom that says, it depends. It depends. If you've got somebody who's actively throwing up and vomiting, do you want to lay them on their back and start grabbing them head to toe? What's going to happen if you lay them on their back and they're throwing up? Yeah, it's going to fountain up like a waterfall and come right back home. They're going to, and they're going to choke on it. So what was our first step that we did? Airway, right? So you always want to keep that CABs running in your head. So if they're actively nauseated and vomiting, you want to roll them over on their side, preferably their left side. One thing that uh, your assessment thing here did not take into consideration or maybe stress. There's a lot of stuff. Well, <laughs> one is you want to watch necks and backs. Depending on what was the causative uh, mm -hmm. action to the injuries, you don't want to try and end up making these people paraplegic or uh, paralyzing or breaking their neck or more damage to backs, depending on what was the causative problem of the accident yep. or, you know, what caused the injuries. And that's one thing you want to definitely watch out for because I've seen a lot of people, or a number of people in my medical career with helpful people ending up uh, causing Causing damage. Yep, and I'm glad you brought that up. And that's one of the things that we will go into further depth with some of the other classes. Right now we're looking at life threats. What's gonna kill you if I, if I keep you from getting paralyzed but I let you die? Did, did you really gain a benefit? And a lot of the research now has shown that a lot of the things that we worried about with neck and back injuries 
were unfounded. So like backboards and seat collars are going away. For those of you who know what backboards and seat collars are, okay? They're not using them anymore on ambulances because they're being taught how to clear a neck in the field without x-ray. I can see the pr practitioners going, oh, that's crazy. It's important to do the assessment in the, in the same position that they're- That you found them. The yep. You don't want to lay them out flat on the- Yep, and again, and these are a lot of those details that we can go into in a much longer, more in-depth class. I could teach a whole hour on just how to do a proper assessment. So to kind of get through all the topics we have today to give you a taste of what we can do, I'm, I'm skipping over some things. You're absolutely right. Yeah, no, I do want class participation. I want you guys asking. Just keep in mind, this is, I am skipping over a lot of details to fit it all into an hour. So good, I appreciate your points and comments. Any other questions about a rapid assessment? So what are we looking for? First off, we're looking for wiggles, wet, and whiny, okay, pain. And then before that, we're looking for three more things and they are? Yep, cabs, circulation, airway, and breathing. Okay, cool. All right, for medical emergencies, these are the most common ones that you're going to encounter as people have things. These are not, hey, I fell off my bike and stubbed my toe, or I fell off the roof when I was cleaning out the gutters, or whatever more creative things your kids are doing, okay? These are things that people have that are diseases in their body, like heart attacks and strokes, and if you really wanna know the most about heart attacks and strokes, I'm gonna encourage you to take an American Heart CPR class. Um, that's a four hour class in and of itself and there's no way I'm gonna teach a CPR in this class. Again, this is just kind of give you a, a brief introduction to what we can do for you. Diabetes, I called it the sweet life because a diabetic friend of mine, bless her heart, tries, no she doesn't. She has good intentions to manage her diabetes, okay? She really doesn't try because she loves her sweets. Um, the thing that I want to bring out about diabetes is that you've got two different problems with diabetes. Regardless whether it's type 1 or type 2 diabetes, they're either going to be too high or too low on their blood sugar. Okay? And I'm boiling it down to very simple terms, so bear with me, guys. They're either too high or too low. How do you tell? Anybody here a diabetic? How do you tell when you're low? Chills, sweats, and nausea. And nausea. Your vision goes all to hell in a bushel basket. Yes, it does. Anybody here ever get high? No. <laughs> wow, that came out wrong. High blood sugar? <laughs> no? Sometimes? Too low blood sugar can end you up dead quicker than, than too high. Up high. And that brings me to the point that I want you to take away today from diabetes. When in doubt, if you're not sure if they're too high or too low, give them sugar. If they're at 27 on a glucometer and they're pale, sweaty, confused, acting like they're drunk or combative and you give them sugar, it's going to help them get better, okay? If they're at, hang on, if they're at 500 on the scale and they're, again, red, maybe dry, a little confused and combative, if you give them sugar, you may spike it up to 550, but you're not going to cause any real damage. Okay? It would take a lot to go up into a diabetic coma. Yes, sir? If you have it, probably for diabetes, for low blood sugar, the best thing you can give them is really orange juice. It works really better than sugar, candy, uh, yep. any kind of sweet um, substance. It gets activated into your system a lot. It, it sure does. A lot faster. And it's better than soda pop. Soda <coughs> pop is not a good one. The only problem is, how do you carry orange juice in this? <laughs> So who's gone to, yes? I have little packets. Little packets. So who's gone to like, uh, 
Wendy's or McDonald's and seeing the little packets of syrup or at KFC and seeing the little packets of honey product. <laughs> it's mainly corn syrup, corn syrup. I, you know, my wife hates me because I'll go to a fast food place and come home with pockets full of condiments. And I've got butter and honey and syrup and all that kind of stuff. That will stay in a first aid kit much better than orange juice. And it works almost as well as the, the oral glucose that we use on the ambulances. So carry some of those. But when in doubt with diabetes, give them sugar. Even if you spike it up to six, 700, it is not as damaging. It is, it's bad, but it's not as bad as not giving them sugar if they're low. They sweat. They get really pale and they get wet. So that's kind of how you can tell, but you can't always tell. So when in doubt, give sugar. Allergies. Whew. Who's ever had allergies before? All right, what do you take for them? Benadryl. Benadryl. Guess what we give them on the ambulances? Benadryl. Okay. Who's heard of an EpiPen for allergies? Do those fix allergies? What do they do for you? They give you adrenaline. Okay, they're temporary. They wear, they wear off in about five to 10 minutes. The long-term fix for an allergy is Benadryl. Okay, so if you have someone that you think is having an allergic reaction and you don't happen to have an EpiPen, what can you give them? Give them Benadryl, absolutely, because how long is the EpiPen going to last? Maybe. Whew. So what do you do in a first aid kit? Carry around a big bottle all the time? or how Tablets. You... Okay, I carry around tablets of Benadryl in my first aid kit. How long does it take Benadryl and tablets to take back? I'm glad you asked. That leads me right into my next point. Normally, when you take Benadryl, you take a tablet, you swallow it. it whew, sorry, Steve. I am bad about technology. Me and technology do not get along. All right, normally you take a pill, you swallow it, it goes to your stomach, it dissolves, maybe. It goes to your intestines, and then your body starts to absorb it, right? It can take anywhere from half an hour-ish for it to work. Who's ever bit your tongue before? Did it bleed? A lot, huh? or busted a lip, you've got all kinds of blood vessels in your mouth. So if you take a pill and chew it up, don't swallow it, chew it up and let it sit in your mouth. The blood vessels in your mouth will absorb that, inf that medication extremely fast, right. usually within one to two minutes, if not faster. Is that also applied to yep, hold it in your mouth. Yes, sir? Sublingual or buccal routes. Okay, those are the technical terms for your cheek and your under your tongue. People who, who has heart medication like nitro they take under their tongue? Nobody? Whew, good. You can put it under your tongue and within 30 seconds, you're feeling the effects of it. It's amazing how fast you can absorb medicine through your mouth if you don't swallow it. So if you have somebody with an allergy, what I want you to take away from this today is give them Benadryl. Hold it in their mouth under their tongue very rapid absorption and it will help them more in the long term than an EpiPen. But if you have EpiPen, use it. Okay? It's definitely appropriate to use the EpiPen. Seizures. Ah, do flashing lights cause seizures? Any opinions? Yes. Okay, what kind of seizures do they cause? Mm -mm. It's not true. It's a myth. Flashing lights do not cause that grand mall shaking on the ground or petite mall where you're just shaking one part of your body, seizures. They cause absence seizures where you just kind of get that blank look and you might fall down, but you lose time. They do cause seizures, but not what we usually think of as a seizure. So just one myth I wanted to kind of clear up and address. Seizures, how do we take care of them? Okay, can you swallow your tongue? No. 
You cannot swallow your tongue. It's attached. Okay. <laughs> Can it fall in the back of your throat and get in the way? Yes, but you can't swallow it. So do you want to put anything in their mouth to keep them from biting their tongue? No. No. Why not? Do you realize that the compression power of your teeth is enough that if you put a finger in somebody's mouth and they clamp down during a seizure, you'll lose a finger? So don't put anything in somebody's mouth you're not willing to lose. And if they bite it off, whatever it is you put inside there while they're having a seizure, what does it now cause a problem with? Choking. Choking. Back to our CABs, aren't we? You always want to keep those CABs in the back of your mind. So seizures, you want to keep them safe from hurting themselves more. Does that mean we hold them down? Why not? Yeah. Those muscles in their bodies are contracting so hard, way more than they normally would. So we call it gorilla strength. Way more than they normally would, they can actually break bones if you try to hold them down during a seizure. So do you want to let them just flop around on the hot pavement? Well, if you make sure that the area around it is safe. Okay. What, can you maybe put something under their head to pat it? A jacket, a shirt, a purse, a backpack? It's going to burn them. I've actually had patients in Vegas in the ER down there at uh, uh, Sunrise where they came in with third degree burns, black charred burns from being on the hot pavement in Vegas. Not nice. It's ugly. It's nasty. But we do want to protect them from hurting themselves, but you don't want to hold them, restrain them, or put anything in their mouths. Yes, sir? What do you do for the ones who just like, blank out, vaporize? Well, I recommend you take your carry a Sharpie and you draw a mustache, <laughs> evil eyebrows, and then get back into the same place. So when they come back to, they won't notice the time has changed and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Absolutely nothing you can do to affect their brains at that point. Yeah, you ready to catch them? Uh huh. Yep, the other way. You see, and that's way beyond even my training. I, I don't do manipulations at all or, or pressure points or meridian work. I say that for other people. Um, yeah, there are things that you can do, but not that I'm going to cover in class or advocate that you do just yet. Shock. What is shock? What do you guys think shock is? Sure. Shock is basically when it's sort of like you're paralyzed for a temporary amount of time. You, like you go into shock and you're so shocked you don't move. Or you, you're shocked with fear and you don't move. It's sort of like being paralyzed for a temporary amount of time. And that's an emotional shock, right? Can your emotions affect your body? Yes, they most certainly can. That's one type of shock. Okay, it can cause shock in your body. What's actually happening? No blood to your brain. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad, okay. So if we have trouble getting blood to our brains, whether it's some emotional shock, bad news, your blood vessels dilate, you pass out, from emotional shock, you've lost blood, there's not enough blood to pump it to your brain, you pass out. You noticing a trend here? Lay down. <gasps> Lay down. What happens when people pass out? They fall down. What then what happens? They wake back up. Shock, very simply put, is low blood pressure. For whatever the cause, whether it's bleeding, emotional trauma, uh, medications, poisons, whatever it is, shock is essentially low blood pressure. That you're having difficulty getting blood to your brain, and so your body starts to shut down, trying to get all the blood that it can to save the brain. And so you get weird kind of effects. Pale, cool, clammy, nausea, vomiting, 
change in the way you think, your mental status, you pass out, you go unconscious. All of these things are all coping mechanisms for your body trying to save your heart, lungs, and brain. And that's what shock is. If, if allowed to go on too long, your whole body can shut down. It'll save the heart, lungs, and brain, but you'll lose your kidneys and your liver, your extremities, your arms and legs, all that kind of stuff. So shock is your body trying to save itself, but at the same time, it's killing it. Does that make sense? Everybody accept that basic explanation of shock? So how do we prevent it? Got to get blood to your brain, which means we got to do what with the person? Lay them flat. Okay, raise their feet. We used to advocate it all the time. Guess what we found out? Eh. It might or might not help. Unless you stand them on their head, it's not very effective. But it can't hurt, so we're going to still do it? As long as what is okay? CABs and their legs are not broken, right? Sure, go ahead and elevate their legs. Oh, any other comments? Okay, whenever you start having all that blood go away from your skin to your center of your body, what happens to their skin? It gets cold and pale, so we want to keep them warm. Put a blanket or something over them. Heat loss and get blood to the brain and heart as much as you can. Try to keep the body from killing itself. Let's talk about burns for a second. What is a burn? Who's had a sunburn? Is that a burn? Yeah. Yes. yes. Can you get blisters from it? Yeah. Yes. Can you die from it? Yeah. Yes. Really? Yeah. Yes. Well, skin cancer, right? Or well, no, more, more, more acute than that. Sooner than that. You can actually die from a sunburn if it's bad enough. It's a radiation burn. What about thermal burns? Anybody ever burned your finger on a match or a hot plate or a fire or a hot liquid? Did it hurt? Yeah. What did you want to do with it? Cold water, right? So you're running it under cold water and it feels so good. What happens as soon as you take your finger out? It hurts again. So what do you want to do? Put it back in. Guess what, guys? The damage is already done. Once you've removed that initial heat with the cold water to begin with, you're not putting under cold water isn't helping to burn any. Okay. Did you know that your brain has a special trick in it that when it gets a constant signal all the time, like most guys, when their wives keep telling them to take out the trash over and over and over and over and over, what does the guy do? He ignores it and turns it off, right? You can't even hear her. Oh, were you saying something, sweetheart? Your brain does the same thing. So each time you put your finger in the cold water, it changes the signal to your brain and it reactivates the nerves in the burn. Each time you take it out, it reactivates it. Each time you put it back in, you reactivate it. So what do you want to do? Can you live with your finger under the faucet? No. So take your finger out of the faucet. Once you've removed the heat from the initial burn, take your finger out, your brain will deactivate the nerves. It won't hurt so bad. Pain is temporary. It's all in your head. When you've got burns that are what we call open burns, where it breaks the skin, do you want to put anything on it? Why not? Infection goes in their bloodstream. What about these burn creams and gels and ointments? Why not? I'm confused. Why would they sell a product that's a burn gel cream to put on burns if you can't put it on burns? You can't put it on burns. Okay, as long as the skin is intact, you can put whatever you want on it. As soon as that skin is broken, don't put anything on it. If it's an open wound, would you want to put some kind of loose cloth over it or something? Yep, it's exactly right. A clean, dry, not wet, loose cloth over it. Why does it need to be loose? Can you think of a reason why it need to be loose? Yeah. All right, it's gonna to stick to it. You want the heat to escape and swelling. If you wrap something tight around a burn and it swells, it's gonna cut off circulation to it. So you want to have a loose, dry, 
dressing. <coughs> Which brings us to some of our other stuff later on. Yes, sir? When you put a dressing on, do you want air to get through the dressing? Or like, yep. Like gauze? Like gauze. Um, there's an exception to this, and uh, this is what, one of the reasons why uh, saran wrap is now used for medical purposes. Um, I kind of take a little bit of credit for that. Um, I had a burn patient um, back in Afghanistan that we sent to Longstool, Germany, wrapped head to toe in saran wrap because he had black char burns over about 60, 70% of his body. Usually in that case, it's fatal. But the saran wrap acted like a second skin. It kept the infection out, it kept the heat in, which is a big problem when you damage your skin. It keeps the heat in, and it kept all the fluids in. So when he got to the burn unit there in Germany, his whole body had been marinating in all that plasma that leaks out from his burn. And we did IVs threw the saran wrap into his veins, so we kept him hydrated. He lived, and the, the burn surgeon that was taking care of him called me back in Afghanistan and said, hey, I wanna talk to the idiot who did this. And I thought I was about to get in trouble. And he said it was the most brilliant thing he'd ever heard of. He'd never thought of that. And he wanted to do a research study on it. He did a research study on it, he published his findings, and the FDA has approved cellophane for medical treatment now. So use saran wrap. Are you talking about stuff you buy in the kit? Yep, look in your kit. Guess what? I took, you want to have me have one of those? Glad cling wrap to a bandsaw and made four inch rolls. And we do a bandage here in just a second because we're starting to run out of time. When we do a bandage here in a second, you're gonna see why I love saran wrap so much. I have a question sure. So you know it could be cool burn, but if it's that all of your body it's a second or third degree burn. You're losing heat. Still, so there's no concern. Right? Don't cool them. You're worried about hypothermia at that point. Your skin its job is to control your body temperature. You sweat, you cool off, it constricts and get pale, you stay warmer. When you lose that ability, you lose heat. And so burn victims, more often than not, rather than having the heat be the problem, it's the opposite. They, losing heat is the problem. Yep. Leave it there. Yeah, have you guys heard of Redmond clay? A bentonite clay is what it is. Super good for localized superficial burns and things like that. Excellent treatment for that. Open cuts, especially if you mix, oh, I'm getting my herbal stuff here. Especially if you mix some comfrey and plantain and things, a few things like that into it as well. Mix it with the clay. Oh, it's wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. I've got a little ball of clay that I keep in my personal medical kit. Silvadine is also good. Silvadine is an excellent. And again, you can make that if you can make colloidal silver. Anybody have a silver generator at home? If you make colloidal silver and mix it with the bentonite clay, you now have a redneck silvadine. Okay. Yes, sir. It does, but it has to come in direct contact with the bacteria. My son did a science, whew, we're, we're gonna run right over time. Are you guys okay with that? I warned you, didn't I? I get, I get teaching and I get over time. Are you guys okay with that? Anybody here got time constraints that has to leave at the end of class? You do? Okay, we'll, we'll be fast. Okay, my son did a science fair experiment. We took Augmentin and Keflex and garlic oil and uh, a concoction a, a, a local herbalist came up with, her name is Lily, uh, called X-Plague, and colloidal silver. And we did a sensitivity plate with it. We took a plate and we put bacteria from his throat, cultured it, and did a sensitivity test. How well it all killed the bacteria. Silver didn't do a darn thing. I was like, oh my gosh, I know it's antibacterial. Why didn't it work? It has to come in direct contact. 
So when I took a plate that was full of bacteria and spritzed it with silver, it died. Everything else had a ring around it where it had inhibited the bacteria from growing around it. So you can take those systemically, eat them, supplements, whatever you want to do, and it will affect throughout your body. But colloidal silver has to come in direct contact with it. Honey is super good, but it works on a different principle. Again, these are things we can go into deeper into a class later on that I would love to teach you guys about the osmotic pressures that honey does to kill bacteria, but we don't have time today to do that. So any other questions about burns? Yes, sir. Wrap it loose. Oh, will it stay, ladies? Will saran wrap stick to itself? <laughs> Who's used saran wrap before? You don't need tape. What about a burn like, say, a child's fat being like, not a child's cheese, but hot? Where the skin's getting tight. Yeah. All right, you're tra starting to talk about different types of burns that I would love to get into deeper and teach you about how to take care of those. Um, extreme care for that is called an SGRotomy, where you cut it open and relieve the pressure, but I'm not covering that today. Okay, but good point. All right, let's talk about bleeding. One of my, one of my favorite phrases is that all bleeding stops eventually. Okay. You either run out of blood or it'll stop itself. It'll coagulate. So how do we stop and control bleeding? The number one, hands down, best thing ever created to cr stop bleeding is your hands. Applying direct pressure. It's not chitazin, it's not quick clot, it's not super industrial cool foam that we can inject into it, it's your hands. Okay, apply direct pressure. Even with arterial bleeds, you can stop with direct pressure if it's applied long enough. Okay, the general rule is at least five minutes for most bleeds. Arterial bleeds, you're probably looking at closer to 15 minutes, half an hour, okay? I've stopped some uh, in the field by just kneeling on the guy's leg. So I had my hands to do other things. And when I took my knee off, after about 10 minutes of taking care of other stuff, the arterial bleed had stopped. One of the big problems that you might want to kind of keep in mind is older people uh, usually are taking blood thinners of yep. some sort, and that is a, an inhibitant yep. to clotting. It will eventually do it. Eventually. It bleed out, the, depending on well, it bleed out. After you, you leak a lot uh, before you can get it stopped, or they'll bleed out depending on the type of injury. But most older people are taking some sort of a and a yep. keep their blood flowing through their heart without all the, all the... All the other stuff that goes with it. So one question, if you've got somebody who's bleeding and they're awake and you can ask them, hey, do you take aspirin or any blood thinners? I hate that term, blood thinners. They're not blood thinners. They're anti-thickeners. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ask them, are you taking this? Is that important? Yeah, yeah why? Well, you just explained it to you, right? It might take longer to stop the bleeding. But if you apply direct pressure with your hand or knee or something, you will be able to stop 99% of all bleeds. So let's open up your kit. I want you using some of the stuff inside it. One other thing that maybe if you put something on like gauze or that over and try to stop, don't ever take, take it off. Uh, we'll get, we're, we'll get there here in a second. Oh, okay. Yep, you're jumping the gun. All right, inside your kit, you're going to see a small roll of saran wrap and a little package with some white gauze inside it. Yep, that one, the big one. Go ahead and open it. <laughs> yes, ma'am, that's it, right there. That one will work too. You've got two different kinds in there. You've got a great big one and a little one. Open whichever one you want. They both work. Sometimes blood needs something to hold it together, to stick it together, to help plug the hole better. In which case you can use these. Or if you're really cheap like I am, mess your back for a second. 
you'll see a little tiny square inside with this little plastic wrap around it. Ladies, you might recognize these. The gentlemen may not. <laughs> this is not a facial towel, okay? <laughs> this is a panty liner for their monthly menses. Guess what they're designed to do? Absorb and stop bleeding, right? Guess what you can use it for? <gasps> stop bleeding. To stop and control bleeding. So if you don't want to spend the 75 cents for one of these, go to the dollar store and spend a dollar and get 40 of these. They work wonderful. Okay, turn to your partner, your neighbor next door to you. I want you to pretend they've got a cut on their arm. Okay, I want you to take that gauze, this nice, great, big, beautiful, pristine, unused muslin cotton gauze. Don't even unroll it. Just take it and poof, stick it right on it. Okay. Stick it on there. Now, take that saran wrap that you've got and wrap it around it as tight as you can. If you pull too tight, your saran wrap's gonna tear. It's okay. Take the end and wrap it around. It'll stick to itself. Just try to keep wrapping. Stretch that saran wrap a little bit as you're wrapping it around. You will be able to apply enough pressure with this saran wrap to control the bleeding just like your hand would. This frees your hands up to do something else. Okay? Like, make sure their airway's open or something. I don't know. How's it feel? Oh, it feels great. It feels wonderful. Can I tell you something while they're doing it? Real quick? Make it can I wait till after class? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's do that after class. Okay. All right, real quick, guys. Because Mark says we're, we're at time. So, bumps in the night and bad days. These are your sprains, strains, and breaks. There's a little thing that the Asians came up with a long time ago called rice. Okay, you've got hot rice and you've got cold rice and I threw the teriyaki in for just a little flavor. What do I mean by hot rice? What does rice stand for? Anybody know? Rest, ice, compression, elevation. Rest, ice, compression, and elevation. So if you have something that is strained or sprained or you think is broken, the first thing you want to do is rest it. Quit using it. Pain is a function of your body telling you to stop doing whatever it is that you're doing. If it hurts, my dad was very wise in his, in his cruelty when I was a kid. I would say, Dad, my knee hurts when I do this. Guess what he told me? Don't do that. <laughs> he was right. If it hurts when you do it, stop. Rest it. In the first 24 hours, ice is extremely beneficial to a sprain or a strain or even a fracture, it reduces the swelling. Hot packs, not so much. They're much better for healing. That's what I mean by hot rice and cold rice. In the first 24 hours, you want cold rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Get it above your heart, that'll help with swelling. Ice it, cool it down, no more than half an hour of ice at a time. If you put it on for half an hour, off for half an hour. That makes sense? Yeah? Yeah, for sure. That's, oh, yeah. that's very good, okay. And then after 24 hours, you wanna do warm rice. Rest it, not so much the ice, but maybe some hot packs or heating pads. This increases the blood flow and gets it healing faster. Compression is always good, it keeps the swelling down and elevation is also as good as well. Whew. Not everybody likes rice, right? They're making you hungry, aren't I? Can you say again what rest, rest, ice, compression, whether you're using the saran wrap or an ace wrap or, oh, good heavens, I can't imagine what else you want to use for it. Well, a belt's a little bit different, but that's more like a tourniquet. Elevation. Get it above the heart. If you get it above the heart, it's harder for the heart to pump blood up to it and you're gonna decrease the swelling that takes place. There's a whole 10 hour class on how swelling works. 
And there's nothing funny about a broken humerus. I thought that, I thought that was funny. Okay. All right, splints. The number one problem that you encounter with all of these sprains, strains, and fractures is pain. It really is a pain in the butt. Okay. So one of the things that you can do to help prevent pain or decrease the pain is immobilize whatever it is that you've got. So we're gonna practice again real quick. Who still got your saran wrap? We're gonna pretend that you have a rotator cuff tear. Woohoo! who's heard of that? A shoulder injury, okay? So your shoulder hurts anytime it moves. So we're going to improvise a splint to prevent your shoulder from moving. You guys ready? All right, who's got your saran wrap? Yeah, I need a volunteer so I can show you what I'm talking about. Da, 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 da. Excellent, and your name is? Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie, my name is Josh. Do I have permission to touch your body appropriately? <laughs> Excellent. I'm gonna take this saran wrap, I don't know, wrap it around her wrist real quick. Not too tight, but enough that when I do this, it doesn't fall up, slide up her hand. And we're gonna take this and put it on her shoulder. And then I'm gonna play Ring Around the Rosie. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Who's worked in shipping and packaging before? Yeah. Stick a label on her and she's done. <laughs> now relax. See how her shoulder is in the nice position of function? And you can check circulation really easy? That's a splint. You can do the same thing with knees and sticks or whatever you happen to find. Saran wrap really is the ultimate first aid tool. You can turn it into string. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm gonna let your husband unwrap you. Who's ever taken plastic and twisted it before? Pretty it's pretty dang strong. It takes about 15, 20 pounds of pressure to snap that. If you wrap it a whole bunch around something, you can tie stuff in knots. The principles with splints that I want you to get today is to keep it from moving. However you achieve that is perfectly fine. I can take a few hours and teach you all different kinds of fancy technical ways of doing splints. Be creative. If, if you take somebody to the ER that looks like the swamp thing with sticks and branches and leaves and moss sticking off of them all wrapped up in saran wrap and they look crazy, but whatever is broken or sprained doesn't move, that's a successful splint. The ER will go, holy crap, what is this? And they'll start cutting away. But as long as it's not moving, whatever it is, knees, ankles, legs, arms, heads, necks, hearts, doesn't matter. If you've got a broken heart, saran wrap may not fix that. Um, I know, right? Sweet, huh? But keep it from moving. We don't want it to go anywhere. We've grown quite attached to it. Okay. Any questions about splints? Last one real quick, guys, is environmental stuff. Whew. What you can't see on the end over there is called the rule of threes. Is gen yes, sir. You need to put one before shelter. I'm not. I'm not yet there yet. Right, three hours without shelter. Three minutes without air. Three hours without shelter. Three days without water, and three weeks without food. Generally speaking, as long as you have the one before it, you can survive to the next step. So if you've got air, you can survive until you die of exposure. If you have a shelter, you can survive until you die of dehydration. And if you've got water, you can survive until you die of starvation. But we're all gonna die eventually, right? Nobody leaves this life alive. It's how we die. It's how we get there. So the two things I wanna focus on exposure real quick are hot and cold exposures. So you've got heat exposure, sweat is cool. Did you guys know that sweat was cool? Sweating is cool. As long as your body is sweating in the heat, you are cooling your body. It evaporates. 
However, when you get to the point to where you are hot and you stop sweating and you get red as a beet and dry as a bone, that's a dangerous life-threatening situation called heat stroke. That's where you are getting more heat either produced in your body or absorbed by your body than you can cool and you will die from it pretty rapidly. So dehydration is the fix for heat exposure. Stay hydrated. When we were overseas in, in the war with the, the deserts and stuff, we would insist they would drink about six liters of water a day, minimum. Anybody have any idea how much water that is? It's about two gallons in US stuff. Okay, about two gallons of water a day. Can you drink too much water? Yes. You can get rid of all of your electrolytes and die from that too. So be careful. Let your body be your guide. If you are peeing about every two hours and it's the same color coming in as it is going out, you're properly hydrated. I know we all look at our pee, right? It's kind of weird. Frost nibbles. I didn't like frostbite. It seems so aggressive. So, so they're frost nibbles. Dews. Shivering is good in the cold, okay? As long as you are shivering, your body is trying to keep itself warm. That's good. That means that you're not that cold yet. When you get cold enough to the point to where you stop shivering and it's still cold, that's a sign that your body is getting so cold that your brain is shutting down and that's a life-threatening situation. But as long as you're shivering, enjoy the cold. When you stop shivering in the cold, go inside. Warm up, okay? When you do warm up, warm slow. Who's ever been outside in the cold and had really cold hands? They're red, they're, they're pins and needles, and you go run some tap water on them to warm them up. Ah! What did it feel like? Excruciating. Excruciatingly painful. Why? Do you know? Warming it up too fast. Warming it up too fast causes damage um, to your body. Because um, your brain sort of got used to that being cold, and when yep. Pretty much. That would have it. Yep, and they start sending a signal to your brain saying, hey, I'm being damaged by the cold and it hurts. And your brain goes, oh, duh, oh, I should probably not do that. Actually, they're dilating, they're getting bigger. They were slamming shut when it was getting cold. So your body tries to save the blood, save the heat. And as it sends blood to your hands, it cools off and comes back and your body doesn't like that. So it shuts the blood off to your hands. But as you warm them up, all those vessels dilate and that cold blood is now going back to circulation. Which is why when you've got somebody who has stopped shivering, you don't want to heat them up fast. You don't want to use hot packs. You don't want to use warm water. Because if you warm them up really fast and that cold blood goes to their heart, you can kill them. They can die from that. Heat them up slow. Warm air. Breathe on them. I'm joking. Get a blanket. Wrap them up. Let what body heat they are producing produce. Climb in with them. Use your body heat. Heat the ambient air around them. Once they start shivering, then you can warm them up. You'd think it would be okay, but cold water still absorbs heat. Water is an excellent absorber of energy, so it's gonna take a lot of stuff out of your body. Even cold water is gonna be bad. That's why if you fall in a cold lake, you still die. It's unfortunate. Good, any other questions about hot and cold? Don't give them a shot of alcohol. I know a shot of whiskey or a hot toddy always helps warm up your, your body, but it's an antifreeze. It does freeze at a lower temperature. However, again, it's going to dilate your blood vessels and make you lose heat faster. So let's not, let's not do alcohol. And the other important thing to remember is when you actually have frostbite, something that's gotten black or white and waxy and hard to the touch and it's frozen. So when you tap it, it sounds like a steak in the freezer. If you decide to help that person, maybe, <laughs> and thaw it out, don't let it refreeze. 
Who's ever had a steak that you thought out and then decided not to eat and put it back in the freezer to eat it later? And it comes out and it's just, uh -huh. it comes out mushy. The same thing happens to the skin. You're gonna damage it more. It's better to leave it frozen and preserved and let the hospital do it the right way. Do it slow, do it slow. All right, basic kit contents. This is the last slide. Everything that you have in your first aid kit in my personal opinion, should be multi-purpose. Unless it is one thing that serves a function that is so important you can't live without, take out everything. You can't think of three ways to use it. Three, three ways. That's just my personal opinion. I like three. Saran wrap. How many uses can you think of saran wrap now? A lot. A lot. Okay. Roller gauze. I can think of two or three for that. Maxi pads or tampons? At least two. <laughs> Find multiple uses. Even an antibiotic ointment, you can use as chapstick or lubricant for other things. It's a great lubricant. It must be easy to use because when you're in a stressful environment, you're going to be excited, nervous, scared, angry, hurt, in pain. You're not going to have all your thinking ability. So it's got to be easy to use. How easy was it to wrap that saran wrap around your arm and make a splint? Could your children do it? Yeah. It doesn't take a lot of brains to be a rocket surgeon. Get training. The best tool that you have in your first aid kit is between your ears, okay? It's your brain. The knowledge that you have, the understanding that you have about what's going on, being creative, how to achieve the principles that you want to achieve, immobilizing bones, controlling bleeding, preventing shock. Three main goals of first aid. If your brain can think of ways to do that, then you don't need any equipment. You'll find equipment to do it with. And here's some suggestions. And these are all in the kits that you got today, except for the multi-tool knife or saw and the headlamp. I like headlamps because if I'm holding a flashlight, how many hands have I got to use? One, I'm half as effective. With the headlamp, I got two hands, I'm twice as effective. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Um, I'm going to be around for, for questions and stuff afterwards. Those of you that need to leave, feel free to leave. Um, there's a few supplies out here on the table that well prepared. Wanted to make sure that I uh, let you know that a lot of the things we talked about today are available here at the store, um, including more training.